The CDC's new mask guidance has Colorado searching for where we put those things and has us searching for whether the governor still has the power to mandate masks. If you're frustrated, you followed the science, you're being told to mask up again, I get it. So do doctors. When it comes down to, look, I don't want to wear a mask anymore. I'm done with it. I'm done with COVID. COVID's not done with us. We visit a gym in the suburbs that's turned out three Olympians this year. A Coloradan who didn't have an Olympic dream until he was hit by a car. Then a whole lot changed at once. An interesting question from one of you. If wildfires are destructive, but they renew our forests, do mudslides also have a hidden benefit, like an exfoliating facial for the earth? Odd question, but this is an odd newscast. This is Next at Night. What Simone Biles did was the epitome of being a true teammate and competitor. And if a, a Broncos or a Nuggets star had done the same thing, They'd be cheered. We'll talk about why. But first, the CDC has updated its guidance. Masks are back. What a miserable announcement today. The refusal by about half the population to get vaccinated is allowing the Delta variant to run wild. So now CDC is talking about masking up indoors for the vaccinated in about half of Colorado's counties. Marshall Zellinger looks at where and whether our governor still has the power to require masks. The Olympics has the medal count. I've got four color-coded flags where gold or yellow is still good. It's just not the best. Colorado, you want to be gold or blue in terms of what the Centers for Disease Control considers low or moderate community transmission of COVID-19. Orange or red indicates substantial or high transmission. Well, here's our version of a medal count. Counties in the good, eight are low, blue, 18 are moderate, gold. For the 38 total counties here that make up the substantial or high areas, the CDC now recommends wearing masks indoors, even for people who are fully vaccinated. Well, where's your county on this list? Take a look at our roster of 64, although I'll make it easier for you. This map makes it easier for you to find where you live or work or hang out. So does this mean people in orange or red counties are going to be required to wear a mask indoors? Not yet. For instance, Larimer County is orange, substantial. In an email, a spokesperson for the health department there said Larimer County takes their guidance from the state health department. If they update their requirements, we will follow suit. So what are the state requirements? Finally getting rid of the health-related emergency executive orders because they are no longer needed. Earlier this month, Democratic Governor Jared Polis ended the statewide public health emergency, but the state health department still has a public health order requiring masks indoors for unvaccinated people, but only at homeless shelters, prisons, jails, and medical settings. Even though the governor ended the state emergency, I found out he can still issue an indoor mask mandate. Then again, so can the director of the state health department or any local county public health department. And they can do it at any time, regardless of what color the CDC gives that county. As for schools, we did a cross check of the metro area today, and so far, no district committed to requiring masks for students. Kyle. Thank you, Marshall. A, th a thought about where we are right now in the pandemic. It certainly seems that we have reached the limit of science and government's ability to persuade people to get vaccinated. Community-based peer outreach might still make a difference. But perhaps it's time for some free market solutions. So let me ask everyone who's vaccinated, would you go out of your way to patronize a business that required all of its adult customers to be vaccinated if their health and religion allowed? Would you seek out those places, restaurants, airlines, gyms? And I mean, why not have it both ways? So let me ask everyone out there who is unvaccinated. Would you seek out a business that said that it welcomed unvaccinated customers? We could even take it a step farther. What if some businesses said they would only serve the unvaccinated? Speaking as somebody who is vaccinated, thanks for the notice. I would be happy to stay away from any business that said it only wanted to serve the unvaccinated. You know what? Their business, their choice, and the other way around too. Free market solutions to our vaccine divide are not without consequences. There are very smart public health leaders that think that that could lead to a false sense of security among the vaccinated, or it might create further polarization. There's a lot of that already. So what do you think on this? Is action by private companies the next step? Or would that just make things worse? I read every word of the feedback that's emailed to next at 9news.com. And we often reach out to highlight some thoughtful divergent views right here on air. The haze that has marked Denver's days lately could be affecting our brains. 
researchers have found a link between air pollution and Alzheimer's or dementia. Our Steve Steger also found some hope, though, from a researcher who says improving our air can slow the mental decline. Fine particulate matter, as it's breathed in, uh, is shown to be related to the uh, you know, the accumulation of plaque in the brain. With all the junk we've seen in our air recently, it seems fitting that this research was shared here. Some of the greatest minds in Alzheimer's research are presenting at the annual conference in Denver this week. One of them, Xin Wei Wang. The dementia risk significantly reduced. She's an associate professor of research at USC. Wang says it's already widely known that the particulates from air can move into the body through both your lungs and bloodstream. And those particulates can lead to neuropathological changes in your brain that could lead to or worsen Alzheimer's. Wang studied people who moved away from bad air. We provide uh, evidence that uh, improve uh, air quality uh, can benefit our, our brain. When air pollution can be reduced, it reduces the risk for people of developing Alzheimer's or it can slow the decline. Jim Hurley he is with the local chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. But it's one of the many factors in terms of Alzheimer's risk. There's age, there's diet, there's blood pressure. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different factors. Hurley, he says understanding air pollution's impact on this awful disease is also important to helping understand why it impacts communities differently. We already know that certain populations uh, black Americans are twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's. Hispanics are 50% more likely, but we don't know how much things like air pollution may factor into that. So what can you do? Short answer is, if you care for someone with dementia, pay attention to the air quality, and if it is an alert day, try to have them stay inside as much as possible. I feel like I went to hell and back to protect them and the people in this room. But too many are now telling me that hell doesn't exist or that hell actually wasn't that bad. That's Team USA right there. The Capitol Police officers who fought off the insurgents playing for some other team on January 6th. Team USA won that day and several of their finest te testified on Capitol Hill today about their attempt to stop the certification of an American election through violence, what the insurgents did that day. Prosecutors say team insurrection included at least nine Coloradans, and one of them, Robert Gieswain of Woodland Park, learned today that he is going to remain locked up through his trial. Judge denied his request to be released from custody while he waits for his trial to start. To hear the gymnastics analysts talk about it today, Simone Biles got one of those mind-body disconnects that we see in all kinds of sports. Like when a baseball pitcher suddenly can't find the strike zone, when a golfer's swing starts to slice, when a basketball player can't hit a foul shot. Only a mind-body disconnect for a gymnast can lead to paralysis with the smallest mistake. You saw Biles went out there to compete, and with one vault, it was clear that she was not herself. She was off her game. And then she decided to be open publicly about the fact that it was not a physical injury. It was a mental health issue, a disconnect that made her continuing to compete just a bad strategy for Team USA. The other three gymnasts would be better positioned to compete. And the American women went on to win silver. And that's a very mature decision. It may not be a very popular decision, but it's a very mature decision because, again, she's not going to put herself in harm's way or her team's in harm's way if her, if her neck up is not on, on point. I think she's really sending a strong message to people of color, to females, that it's okay to raise your hand and say, hey, I'm not 100% right. Here's what I, I just don't get about the vitriol directed at Simone Biles today, these suggestions that she, she quit on her team or she embarrassed her country. She did the opposite. She helped America win the silver. She went out there. She tried. She was struggling. So she made a selfless choice, not a selfish choice, to let a teammate replace her in the coming events and hopefully perform better than she could. That happens in every team sport imaginable. If a star player is humble enough to acknowledge that they're not performing at their best or not performing at the level of their teammates. We've certainly seen what happens when superstars who don't have it on a particular day insist that they stay in the lineup just because they're a star. 
Simone Biles not only prioritized her mental health, she put her teammates' medal chances and her country's medal chances before her own ego. That was a true superstar move. So you know Coloradans home to a lot of Olympians, and there is one place in Wheat Ridge where there are three Olympians under one roof. Matt Renew joins us from the 5280 gym. Matt, it's a veritable Olympian factory. It is, Kyle. They're just churning them out here, and it's an interesting story because the three Olympians that are under here, uh, the roof here, one of them is in Tokyo right now. Another one won a medal in 2008, and then his dad is here, and he represented the Soviet Union. If you're looking for a place in Colorado where Olympic gymnastics history is flying high, then the 5280 gym in Littleton is your place. With three generations of Olympians, including one who's in Tokyo right now as 25-year-old Yule Moldauer makes his mark with Team USA. I still remember when I was a little kid cheering about being in this position, and now that I'm in this position, it's, it's been unreal. These guys work out two times a day. On the floor watching him is Yule's coach, Sasha Artemiev. He was part of the 2008 United States men's team, the last men's team for the U.S. to earn an Olympic medal 13 years ago in Beijing. They have a medal since 2008. And then there's Sasha's dad, Vladimir. We are too much busy. The guy in front of the American flag backdrop who used to be a gymnast for the former Soviet Union and would have gone to the 84 Olympics had his country not boycotted them. I was gymnast long time ago and uh, Soviet Union national team long time. Nice, nice. All of them under one roof at the 5280 gym making Olympic history right here in Colorado. Yeah, I don't know. It must be something in the water. It's definitely something in the water. Of course, Yule, the big athlete right now, got a lot of watch parties, but you don't have to be like Yule. You can also be like these folks. They have adult gymnastics classes here where they can get on the bars and do the flipping and all the jumping and that kind of stuff, and it is a lot of fun. Kyle, I got to tell you, you see these guys here late at night, and it really just inspires you to want to get out and do your own Olympic routine and see what you can do. You know, we're about halfway through our Olympic coverage, and I got to say, I think we're hanging in there, Kyle. <laughs> you, though, have been training for this for years. I know that, but still, it makes it no less impressive. Matt Renew, thank you as <laughs> yeah. always. So, you know, we're all in for Team USA around here, and maybe in your home you've got another country that you root for in addition. In case you don't, can I invite you to join us in getting behind Liberia, for one, Great flag, 150-year relationship with the U.S. of A. Liberia's never won a medal. And that country fights against great odds just to afford to get athletes to the Olympics each time. So, can we get some Liberian national anthem music, please? The Liberians actually got rare attention at the opening ceremony because the team that usually has to scrape to come up with sponsors had some beautiful uniforms thanks to the Liberian American designer Telfar Clemens. Liberia's three athletes, all sprinters, begin competing this weekend. Liberia's medal count stands at zero. This is not a surprise to you. I told you a moment ago that they had never won a medal. I don't even know why we have to show the medal count, but this is how it works. We really hope to put a one up there for Liberia by the end of the games. You respected the public health rules. You got vaccinated. And now the CDC's telling you to put on a mask again in half of Colorado's counties. Come on. We're on this plane ride and the conditions are changing. We're kind of flying blind, trying to figure out what the next thunderstorm is going to be. Doctors feel your frustration too. The battle over one of Denver's last big open spaces could come down to two voter decisions. Not yes votes versus no votes, but which side gets more? Yes, folks. And the worst day of a Coloradan's life opens the door to an opportunity of a lifetime. Next. Park Hill Golf Course is one of the last wide open green spaces in the city of Denver. To avoid being developed, advocates for open space will not only have to win a ballot initiative coming up, they're going to have to get more yes votes 
than a separate ballot initiative that would nullify their win. This is confusing, I know, but we cannot give up on understanding what is happening in our community just because it is confusing for voters and perhaps purposely confusing. Denver voters are going to see an initiative from Save Open Space Denver to Save the Open Space in Denver, the golf course. Developers are pushing a separate initiative that would basically cancel out a win for the open space. They both could pass. And if that happens, and if they're ruled to be in conflict with each other, Denver Elections told us today it would come down to which initiative gets more yes votes. CDC is calling on Americans, even the vaccinated, to wear masks indoors again in places where there is substantial or high spread of COVID. That is 38 of Colorado's 64 counties, including Adams and Douglas in the metro area. And there's audible frustration from the vaccinated that anti-vaxxers now have America backsliding on case counts. Healthcare workers worry about the lost trust that comes from calling for masks again. I think what's happening is that we've lost a lot of credibility in the public. And so, you know, in May, we basically said, hey, look, if you get vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask anymore. And so now all of a sudden it feels like this frustration, um, rightfully so for a lot of folks who said, well, wait, I did what was right. I did what was best and I got my vaccine. And now all of a sudden you're telling me to wear a mask again. And I think what we have to keep telling them is, look, I don't know. We're still learning a lot about this this variant. We're learning a lot about COVID-19. And unfortunately, you know, like, I think you actually should. Vaccinations have moved less than half a percent in Colorado in the last week. Relatively few Coloradans have been vaccinated in the last month or so. Any chance that one of you is watching? I ask this because I think that we tend to make a lot of assumptions about why people are choosing to get vaccinated after that initial rush. And I'd rather hear directly from you if you're willing to share your reasoning. If you've been vaccinated in the last month, would you tell me why? What was it that changed your mind? What motivated you? It might lead to some more thoughtful conversations that we can share here. Email next at 9news.com. Again, I read each and every email that comes in. I'll keep an eye out for these. He was an athlete, sure, not an Olympian, though. Then he was hit by a car, paralyzed from the waist down. Coloradans life changed in a lot of ways that day. Our Kelly Rinky met up with a man from Lakewood who is now heading to Tokyo to compete in the Paralympics. As long as you execute well, the arrow generally goes in the middle. Perfection comes with practice. You know, you got to want to put in the work to, there it is, show up and, and be the best. So Sometimes hitting the mark comes easy for natural athletes like Kevin Mather. I'm looking for a sunscreen sponsor, but uh, he gave archery a shot just a few years ago. I set up this range um, 2017. Mather holds several world records, but becoming one of the best in the sport wasn't easy. I was a triathlete at the time. I was out on a training ride with about nine or 10 other guys. A vehicle came up behind me and just hit me doing about 65 miles an hour. After becoming paralyzed from the chest down after a hit and run. About the T5 level. He uh, traded in his bike so, for a bow. Uh, I wanted to be me again. I don't know if that makes sense, but like I was super driven, like always wanting, like setting goals, ambitious, like doing more than I like, you know, biting off more than I can chew all the time. but. That ambition is taking him to Tokyo as a member of the U.S. Paralympic archery team. The para team is like, we take that idea of can't and just like wad it up and throw it out the window. An athlete to the core. People often ask me like, well, you shoot archery is kind of your job right now. So what do you do for fun? And I'm like, well, I shoot archery. Um, <laughs> And the target that he has to hit to get the most amount of points is incredibly small. It's 12 centimeters in diameter, which is shorter than the length of my cell phone. And he has to shoot his bow from 70 meters away, which is more than half of a football field. He's going to head to Tokyo in a couple weeks, and the Paralympics start on August 24th. Kyle. Boy, talk about turning misfortune into an opportunity. Great story. Kelly, thank you. When rain turns a burn scar into a muddy slip and slide, does that protect the land from future mudslides and fires? You have burning questions about Mother Nature, and we're in the business of getting you answers. And a word about a national embarrassment for the U.S. on the world stage, a completely avoidable mistake. Next.
Tonight's next question comes to us from a viewer named Corey Greer. He reached out after a recent string of mudslides shut down highways across Colorado. Hey, next. My question is, after mudslides occur, is the landscape any more or less resilient to future mudslides or to future fires in areas where burn scars cause the mudslides? That is a good question, Corey. We took it to Greg Hansen with the National Weather Service in Boulder. It really you know, it depends on the amount of rain and the amount of material that moved. Um, I think for the most part, when we're talking about mudslides and the, the ashy debris left over after a wildfire, um, I think there's still going to be enough left behind to where you, the same amount of rain could still cause a debris flow in that same exact area. The uh, mudslide component of that question isn't as important as just that the fact that that area has been burned. Having had a fire go through, that reduces the fuel load, and so it makes that area less susceptible to fire in the future, or if one starts, it's a much lower intensity type fire. We are in the business of getting you answers because bottom line is if you're wondering about something in Colorado, we know that other people have the same question. So just record your question in a video or audio message and email it to next at 9news.com. So you have social distancing that is built into this year's Olympics in all kinds of different ways. And it is miles worth of distance for one man on the U.S. fencing team. Our sports reporter, Ariel Orsuto, says this is an embarrassment to America. After the first few days of Olympic competition, we've already seen American exceptionalism at its best, with first ever wins in some events and repeated medals in others. But we've also taken a few losses. The biggest? Allowing an athlete who has had multiple sexual assault accusations to compete on the world's biggest stage. Days after fencer Alan Hedsick joined the Olympic team, six women fencers filed formal complaints of sexual misconduct to the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, the nonprofit agency responsible for protecting athletes from abuse. Yet instead of taking these complaints seriously, once again, they were dismissed faster than Shakari Richardson was dismissed for taking performance enhancing drugs. USA fencing took it a step further and created the most insulting safety plan to protect women on the team. Hadsick was required to take a separate plane to Tokyo, stay 30 minutes away from the Olympic Village in his own hotel, and practice away from all women. In other words, he was too dangerous to be around his own teammates, but safe enough to represent our country, armed with an epe and entitlement. You have some fiery feedback on the idea of businesses in Colorado requiring vaccines. You get the last word next. I've spent every one of our breaks reading through your emails on the idea of free market solutions to the lack of vaccinations, i.e., what would happen if private businesses decided to require customers to be vaccinated. And somebody else could say, I'm only going to serve the unvaccinated. Lisa in Denver says it's not realistic. And she says, I also don't think it's a necessary tactic. Alan in Ure said that he would certainly patronize a business that decided to only serve the vaccinated. And Alan said that he would even pay more if they needed additional staff for safety protocols. Hunter Leach wrote in to say that Nine News is demented and that I am pompous for even suggesting it, said that we need unity. His suggestion was your one-sided waste of airtime should be shut down.